Okay, now for all you guys that want to take a break from taking pictures and actually understand something about what it is that makes a camera special, take it away. Tell us about this beast, the decisions made behind it, the thought processes, you know, how you and what's different in it because so, there are differences. Before we start, if I could just just give a bit of the background for you know the the redesign of the UI. When you're talking to Lao about the user interface of the, the IQ4, it's Lao and uh, you know, Soren Ilso, another engineer in Denmark, and uh, a few other guys, but they're really the ones that just make this UI from scratch. And so all of these interactive uh, ways in which we use the XF and everything, it kind of comes from Lao and Soren you know, just having an idea of, what if we could do this? And then they come down and talk to me and a few other photographers and just say, what tools would you want in this place? How would you see yourself interacting with this? So when Lau's going over this UI, Lau has built this UI. So you know, he knows exactly how, what it took to, to put this here and how this needed to work. And so you know, there's going to be a little bit of baggage behind the scenes when Lau's talking about the pull down menus and the touch interface and everything. But uh, you've got the best resource possible to go through this UI. But with also you. don't, don't uh, tell us about the sensor too, because yes. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, that's a whole total uh, new kind of concept there. Um, so. You know, yeah, so take, maybe take I can away. start from, from the sensor, actually. Okay. So we, we have this new fantastic backside illuminated sensor uh, that not just has more pixels, but it has better pixels. And the backside illuminated technology essentially enables us to, to have smaller pixels, but at the same time also better pixels. So the, the sensitivity, the noise, the color fidelity of those pixels are just significantly better than anything else we've seen. Even though you're using smaller pixels, you're, the, the design of the pixels means that they're being used to peak efficiency. Yeah. So we can have bigger pixels, but in a front side illuminated structure, you're, you're not getting the most efficiency out of the pixel. So even though they're bigger and you would expect that to result in better image quality, it's so poor in how you're actually using that, uh, that mm -hmm. pixel. With backside illuminated, now we have a smaller pixel, but we use it to 100% of its efficiency. So essentially, um what happens is if we start out with the wafer, a, a thin slice of silicon. It's not this thick. No, it's... <laughs> for it, it is for really, scaling purposes. For the scaling purposes. <laughs> we start out with the wafer, and then in a, in a very long, elaborate process of etching and stenciling and printing, the, the pixels are built up on top of and into the silicon substrate. The pixel well itself is kind of at the bottom into the substrate. It has to have a certain physical volume to contain the electrons. Uh, that are released by the photons. Then on top of this is the layer of electronics for um, conversion of the charge to electricity and transporting it out. And, the and they analog. sit on top. Mm -hmm. They sit on top, yes. Okay. Because you have to build the, the pixel well first inside the software and then build all this uh, infrastructure on top of it. So on top of that then are the Bayer color filters and then the micro lenses. So light then shines in through the micro lens through the color filter, and it has to pass this layer of electronics before it gets to the pixel itself. So some of the light will hit all of these transistors and wires and so on and be scattered and lost. Um, with very large pixels, it's not a big deal because you have a large pixel with a bit of electronics. So most of the pixels just be kind of a clear path for the light. But as the pixels get smaller and smaller and smaller, it becomes a relatively much bigger problem because more of that surface area of the pixel will be blocked essentially by electronics. So the simple solution to this is that we take the wafer, make the pixel well and the electronics, then flip over that wafer and grind away the material from the rear side. Now who, who would have thought of doing, <laughs> well it's just scraping engineers. off the back side. It's just engineers. So course. essentially that, by doing that, we get down to the pixel well itself, but from the rear side. And then okay. we can put the color fillers directly on top of the pixels and then micro lenses. So now when the light shines in, it comes directly through the color filter and into the pixel. It doesn't pass that layer of electronics. It doesn't and, have to you know. pass that layer. So much more of the light can actually be captured by the pixel. So it, it creates a more efficient sensor, a much more noise-free sensor, because it doesn't have to be gained so much to be sensitive. Um, and another very nice side effect of this is that now the electronics are no longer in front, so we can build more, much better electronics. Because when it's in front, there's a compromise between how much electronics we put there yep. and how much light can get through. When it's on the backside, behind the pixels, it doesn't matter. So we can essentially put 
more electronics in there, adding features, new, cap new interesting capabilities to the yeah. pixels themselves, but also just increasing the, the speed, the readout speed, the readout capabilities significantly. So all in all, the new sensor, of course, is high resolution. It's much lower noise. It's super high color quality, and it's very, very fast. So this, especially the last point, the very, very fast combined with high resolution meant that we had to rethink essentially the, the whole platform, the data moving, processing platform of our digital bags to be able to really keep up with that. Um, so it wasn't just about keeping up with 50% more pixels, but also a much higher readout speed, uh, higher frame rate and all of that. So we completely overhauled all of that. There's nothing inside an IQ4 shared with an IQ3 essentially. Well, we just with the sensor though. So what are we talking about speed-wise in the sense of, let's start with ISO. We're doing mm -hmm. a base ISO of 50? Yes, 50. And a high ISO side of what? 25,000. 25,000. 25,600. Yeah. And that, that ISO is, you know, we're, we're pretty open about the fact that it is a very artificial limit. Mm. You know, it, it, if we wanted to, we can make that go up to 5 million. It's just, you know, what we just decide to put into the actual system. Now, 25,600 is where we feel the responsible limit is of we wouldn't want anyone to shoot over this yeah. because they would just be kind of disappointed with the results. We wouldn't feel good as a tool maker, uh, you using that, yeah. that ISO. So 25,600 is, you know, uh, an artificial limit that we impose on the, mm. the camera system. So yeah, that we're confident in the 25,600 is clearly noisy. Yes. But it's, it, it's definitely it's manageable. useful. Yeah. It's definitely useful. There are images that you can really yeah. use at that ISO. And we got the benefit of putting those files into Capture One, which we also yeah. make, so we know how to handle that noise, how we yeah. can uh, mitigate it and really give you the best image quality. What kind of capture rate are we talking about? On the XF system, we are talking about uh, two, more, two more, plus frames a second. Yeah, two go. frames a second at 151. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Megapixel resolution. And of course, there's ways to make it faster. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also ways to make it slower. Yeah. It all depends on how you want to set up the camera system. You know, this is a, a DSLR. There is a mirror in there that's going to move. There's two shutters in there, a leaf shutter, a focal plane shutter. Depending on which one you use, the camera, the mechanics can actually move out of the way faster. Uh, if you want to put the mirror up, you know, there's all these different setups so that you can get faster frame yeah. rates. Okay. Or you can just use the electronic shutter remove all of the moving mechanics, and now the camera system can shoot closer to three frames a second just using the electronic shutter. Are you changing the file quality yesterday when we were doing this? There was a number of different selections for the uh, the quality of the file, yeah, the, I guess, the, or lack. What, what were those? It's the, the file format and also the compression. They're kind of okay. two in one when it then comes in, to In a addition to that, system. yes, so as Drew said, there are the, the compression, the types of compression, but also, because we have this capability of adding more features to the pixels themselves with electronics, uh, there's a mode that essentially does the, the readout and the analog to digital conversion more carefully and slower, resulting in a cleaner file, lower noise, a little bit higher dynamic range, but a little bit slower frame rate. So we, we have these flexibilities because of the, the more advanced electronics in the sensor. And these are really just the beginning of the, the flexibilities that we have. Yes. You know, we, we always talk about how this camera system is built to grow and how we want customer feedback so we can expand the camera system. What we have today is really just the beginning. So having that different mode where we can squeeze out a little bit more dynamic range, but we sacrifice a frame rate for a landscape photographer, for, you know, not make a difference, right, of course, you want the best image quality. But then we have another mode that kind of goes on the other side of that uh, for somebody that's shooting in a studio with uh, fashion. Maybe they're shooting for a, a magazine cover or something. They don't need 151 megs of resolution. Well, we have a way to bin these pixels. So you get 25% of the, uh, the full sensor resolution. You get a faster frame rate. You get a smaller raw file, faster transfer speeds if you're shooting over Wi-Fi. So we kind of look at both ends of the, the spectrum here in terms of you know, what the mm. use case is and how we want to implement the, uh, the use of the camera system in the file. So format. the user has a lot of choices in regards yeah. to what yeah. he decides yes. based upon the photography that he's doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's pretty cool. And we've designed it so that, that we have a lot of possibilities in adding <clears throat> things to it down the road. We've, we've essentially cramped much more processing power into the new platform that was kind of upfront needed just to handle more pixels because we didn't just want to be able to do the same things with more pixels. We wanted to have a platform where we, over the next many years, can innovate and essentially create new features. Cool. When I started, we used to connect with Firewire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you just mentioned, and it just made me think here, wireless. Yep. So 
What's the connectivity kind of uh, options with this new camera? For the IQ, since the IQ2 and the IQ3, uh, we've had a Wi-Fi uh, antenna in there. When we redid the IQ4, we really looked at what is the future of tethering. Uh, mm -hmm. we, can, we can consider like, well, we went from FireWire 400 to FireWire 800. Then yep. we went to USB 3, now we have USB-C. You know, these things are gonna change and adapt over time. There's gonna be a new form factor, there's gonna be a new protocol that's an actual piece of hardware. Networking is never going away. And, and if it changes, it's a software change, right? We, we can update the network communication of this. So we introduced the uh, the RJ45, just a normal Ethernet jack. Um, so that's the, on there. since it's the same the same network infrastructure as uh, <clears throat> all the office networks, many uh, nothing has changed there for years. Right. No. no. And, and, it, and it won't. And, I mean, and there's a lot of very interesting things we can start doing now. We we said we have standard off-the-shelf networking hardware built into the back. So it's all about driving this with software from now on, integrating into the existing network infrastructure. And so since we, we decided that's the direction we're gonna go and we built that uh, physical ethernet jack in there and we've always had a, a Wi-Fi antenna, we just beefed up the Wi-Fi antenna, used that networking protocol and now you can capture wirelessly mm. with 151 megs of resolution. The speed of which is gonna depend on your infrastructure. If you have a dedicated router that's you know, five gigahertz and there's not a lot of interference, you're gonna be looking at you know five or six seconds to transfer a raw file uh, to your computer. Or a still life shooter or something working mm -hmm. in a studio wouldn't have any issue with that. Or True. Somebody working up on a platform. But I think what's know. more fun for us is we don't really think that, you know no one's gonna use this camera system and just shoot Wi-Fi. Yeah. Because there is gonna be this delay and speed is everything. <clears throat> so the Wi-Fi is kind of there when we think about it as a, a backup, as a safety net, where I can be shooting over the uh, USB-C uh, I can be shooting as fast as I need to be, but then a digital tech or a client or something trips over the cable and it gets disconnected. Well, you know, this thing has already set up on the Wi-Fi, so it just starts shooting over Wi-Fi because yep. it knows that there's a host waiting for it. So you, it loses one, it, it, it's automatically still doing the other. Right. And you can, uh, if you have an onboard storage card in there, it will also store all the files to that one. So if something happens to the tether so connection, redundant and redundant. or to the computer, right. it's on that card as well. Or and if the laptop gets, the bag with the laptop gets stolen on the way home from the shoe, the file's also on the card in the, in the camera, so kind of as a, as a backup system. And then we think of kind of the, the hybrid workflows with that, uh, that Wi-Fi, where you know, in the future, we want to make this camera system so that you can shoot to your local computer in the studio, uh, also do a backup on the XQD and the SD card, but that Wi-Fi is just sitting there doing nothing. Now, we already talked about how much power is in the IQ4. So that Wi-Fi connection could send a copy to my client in you know, Hong Kong or New mm. York or and maybe that, send that a That copy doesn't have to be a full raw file. It could be a uh, little yeah. reference JPEG just right. for sorting and selection. Well, you make a reference JPEG now, correct? Yes. So b because it has more processing power, we are actually, we've been discussing this with JPEGs for years in phase one. Yeah. We believe that you should always make raw files. Photographers use our cameras to get the best possible image quality and all the flexibility of a, a raw workflow in post-production. Okay. But sometimes being able to deliver files quickly, JPEGs, as a, we see the JPEGs that we can make now as a workflow enable. Yeah. But to really have that, they shouldn't just be kind of default JPEGs. So with the addition processing power, we've actually taken the, the processing engine inside Capture One and ported it into the IQ4. No which is what we call Capture One Inside. It's of course not all of Capture One running inside with the whole application, but the processing engine itself. So the JPEGs made inside the bag, and also of course all the previews you see on the screen there or that can be sent to your iPad, they are all done with the same engine. So they have the same pixel level look, the same pixel level quality, and they can have the same styles applied. So you can apl apply styles, black and white, uh, yeah. so you know, your own styles if you created yes. them. And you're actually seeing what you're shooting. So if you were what you see is what you get. So if you're a landscape photographer and you have, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm more into contrast and a little saturation and just a tad of warm, and I create my own style. I can now load my style in here and actually yes. witness that and see that yeah. on the rear screen. And what happens with it? Of course, it it does not affect the pixels in your raw file. That's a raw still file. a raw file, but, but you're seeing the preview. It gets embedded of, in the raw file as metadata. So when you open that raw file in Capture One, it starts there with so, that style applied, and you can you can continue working from there because it's it's the full Capture One settings that are just 
being put into, into the file and loaded back into Capture One. That's what we did with those images uh, yesterday. When yeah, we so you can always go and do a reset, or when you do imports, yeah. they don't, yeah. you know, it's as well. Or in, tweak it a little bit further. Yeah. Yeah. Start, start from there, it's kind of a starting point. Yeah. So you can have a few different of your own styles in the camera, so when you're out there, in the, in the weather, on location, you feel inspired, <laughs> you think, I was th I'm thinking this way about this image, I picked this style. It's kind of a note to self when I get back to editing, I start from here. Yep, and, and you can and, always make the changes. And photographers that have their own, you know, unique look to their yep. images, you know, having that just recorded in the actual file. Yeah, my signature style, right in yeah. the field. And yeah. it also means that if you if you use the ability to make JPEGs as a workflow enabler and hand those JPEGs to somebody, then they are your JPEGs with your style. They are not kind of default uh, color, standard color JPEGs. They are your JPEGs. Yeah, my style JPEG. Your style JPEG. So they could either be uh, right, the sent or Wi-Fi to somewhere, like yeah, yeah. posted to social media. Yes, or imagine you are you are you're traveling somewhere. Um, the 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 digital bag has XQD and SD card in there. Of course, XQD is the fast, reliable, new standard. SD is maybe not the new fancy standard, but SD cards are everywhere. You can always pick up a new SD card somewhere <laughs> if if you. Uh, run out of cards or if you lose them, always find an SD card. But the other th side is that everybody can read an SD card. Yeah. Everybody can read an SD card with JPEGs. So if you're somewhere photographing, you meet somebody that kind of helps you out, lets you photograph their, their special place, their home, their family, their village, their, their temple, something, and you wanna, you wanna give something back. You just give them an SD card. You give them an SD card with JPEGs. Everybody can use an SD card JPEGs. Now I have to applaud you because it's kind of funny right now in this <laughs> in the state of the industry right now. It's like, you know, we, we've had uh, two major camera companies come out with just you know single card slots. Right. Of course, mm -hmm. that's caused quite a stir. And, and we've and, we've and, always and, just had one card slot. Yeah, but so now you know we just right, reverse right. the mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But you're you're flexible enough with this that you can do two raws. So raw and raw. Yeah. A raw and a, a JPEG or styled JPEG or mm -hmm. yeah and. You know, you can take the XQD card out, keep the SD card in to continue capturing. Just, yes. you know, and I think, oh. you know, we don't need to go over what we can do with the system because that's not the point. No. The point is we're set up to do whatever it is our customers We need. designed the platform so that there are no bottlenecks. All data can flow to all destinations independently. In, in any way that we need them to. So we, we designed the platform that way so that now when we, when we get feedback, when we work with photographers, we see what are what are the next next set of requirements? God, you're such we can a good we can make that. <laughs> we can we can, we can do these things. Visionary. Yeah. Uh, yes, and of course, a, a simple thing like backing up. Yep. SD cards are not that fast as XQD with a, with a, a lot of pixels and a fast frame rate. Having the super fast XQD cards means that you can clear the buffer quickly. So what it does with the SD card is that it then slowly in the background just copies them over. So you quickly clear the buffer. To the XQD, and then you copy them over, kind of as a as a as, backup, as a, time. As a, as a backup yeah. in the background. So you don't have to; you're not kept back by a slower SD card. The the histogram. People have always asked questions, both on DSLR side of things, and of course the yeah. medium format side of things. You know, am I really looking at a true histogram, or I'm looking at a histogram which is a, a result of uh, a processed JPEG? Mm -hmm. So we actually do both. Okay. So on the, on the IQ4, you 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 will get as with an IQ3 uh -huh. and all the other cameras. You'll get a histogram based on essentially that preview JPEG, 8-bit okay. preview with whatever white balance and styles applied. The good thing about that is that it's kind of it's, it's easy to understand. This is the this is the preview, and this is the histogram for that preview. And there is some headroom on both sides, so if I get a bit wrong, I can fix it in post. I don't and know exactly how much on each side, but I have that headroom. With the capture one inside, you know, that JPEG that you're seeing, that, that histogram referencing that JPEG is based on your style that you built. Yeah. So there is not, uh, you know, a lab technician in Denmark that's de deciding how that JPEG looks. With capture one inside, you actually decide how mm -hmm. that JPEG looks, therefore what the reference is for that, uh, that histogram. But the other thing we're doing is making a raw histogram, which is an actual histogram of what is in the file. Essentially, the, is it raw, a linear? Is it would be called linear then, or would it can essentially be both? I think if we make it a linear raw histogram, yeah, maybe, that would yeah. be a hard thing to uh, to evaluate. So we we I will apply the the curve a garment to it, but but what you see there is actually what's in the file before white balance, before any anything else is applied. 
So it's it's actually what is in the file. And that, is that a first for the IQ4? Before, yep. Yeah. Have you, it's never been. We've, on, done, we've done, done that. And this is this is. So that essentially is a is a hardcore exposure tool. Yeah, it's a real hardcore tool that has been asked for by if, if, if you, you expose know, drivers if, like myself for forever. If, if you expose so that that histogram is all the way to the right, it's optimal. If it's a little bit that all the way to the right, if it's a little bit over there, it's gone. It's there's no headroom. It's kind of it's. Now, now when you're thing. looking at it, you're looking at yeah. Yeah. exactly what's there. Yeah. And that's been asked for so long. I mean, uh, you know, another camera company recently decided they were going to take the screen off the back of the camera. And yes. uh, it, that upset me considerably <laughs> when I wrote the review on it. And I said, well, you know, at least give me a histogram because, you know, I don't need the chimp. I mean, I, I know what mm. I shoot through the viewfinder, but for me, Understanding that I've got the exposure properly right. yeah. is the most important part, and that you know, understanding that through a histogram and an accurate histogram, yeah. and now being able to also know that you know my landscape style histogram. Exactly. You know, if I can look at both and see yes. that they both are there. Yes, because the problem with a raw histogram is that because it's before white balance, before okay. any style applied, you can have a histogram that does not clip that looks right, yep. but once you apply white balance and, and some editing, it could actually push it out of what you can yeah. see on your screen or what your printer can do. So in that way, uh, the other kind of the, the processed histogram also makes sense because it shows you that even with the processing, my histogram still works. Yeah. So having both at the same time, time we believe is a, a strong combination. Very cool. So what else? What else you, that I need to know here? So what else can we... Um, before we go into the interface, I mean, anything more as far as... I think, you know, we can just touch on the fact that the, the IQ4, as Lau said, is for all intent and purposes, 10 times more powerful than we had with the IQ3. Yeah. Um, and uh, the XF is something that we released in 2015. It's something that we've had more features based on customer feedback and suggestions. You know, we keep growing with firmware updates, new features, new functionality into the XF. Mm -hmm. uh, the XF is going to continue to grow and expand and have more features. When we couple the XF, which you know was kind of fixed, and this is how much processing power it has back in 2015, it's now 2019. Uh, when we couple that with the IQ4 and all of its processing power, now all of a sudden we kind of expand what we can do with the camera system as well. Mm -hmm. Because now the IQ4 can uh, process more information, use more information, and the XF can benefit from all of those computations and all of that yeah. evaluation. So, even though we're just introducing uh, the IQ4, you know, a new digital back, we are upgrading the entire system. Yeah. When you couple that with the XF, with the blue ring lenses, you know, because we're in control of all these things, because we, we build all of these things, now all of a sudden we can expand the entire system. So it's not just like we're bolting on, you know, a, There's a, integration, a new... integration, and yes. everything is yeah. talking. Exactly. So, so essentially, as Drew said, the, uh, the XF camera can now start as a system. So the XF IQ4 system. Right can now start to have features that, that are based on what the, what the camera body can do, combined with uh, the new digital bags, processing power, and ability to actually crunch the pixel data. So we can have camera features that are based on actually looking and this deep is, into pixel data. This is really the benefit of having you know, a modular system where we have you know, lenses, of course, that can exchange, but we have a prism with its own ability to interface with the camera body, the camera body with the digital back. You know, every time you upgrade one of these components, all of a sudden you get a whole new system and we get all new possibilities. And so that makes it, it makes it incredibly exciting for, for Lau and I when we uh, get back to Denmark and we start thinking about how can we move these things around. I think it makes it incredibly frustrating for a lot of our engineers because yes. we've got so many ideas and so many ambitions for this camera system that you know, we've, we've got to choose a path. Yeah, it, essentially where for, for us the, the, most, the most interesting capability of the IQ4 is the ability to grow. So, so how do you decide what you're going to do next? And I mean, uh, most of it comes from customer feedback, of course. Um, I have my own personal ideas. Lau has his own personal ideas. But that doesn't do anybody any good uh, because, you know, we're not the ones that are, are buying these camera systems. I, of course, own one, but just the one. So we need to look at, you know, all of our different customers, all of their different ways of working, and, and try and find kind of the the symbiotic relationships between yeah. everything that they're asking for and kind of move in that direction. And if you look at the XF and the feature updates that we've had with the XF over the years, you can kind of see these pivots, you know, from one discipline kind of now using those tools and moving over into the fashion industry and then moving over into the studio still life. So 
that kind of growth path, there's mm. no one direction. We take it all in and we just try and find a path that can weave through what everybody needs. And also That's bringing uh, the, <clears throat> kind of the, the technology ideas we have, the, the technology we designed into this, the ideas about what we think would be possible to do, and merging that with what we see photographers do. See, I see you doing something, but I bring my uh, knowledge of what I think we can do technically. Ah, you have, maybe this will help you. <laughs> so we, we kind of want to merge. I like that idea. We, we want to we wanna bring together that uh, kind of customer, photographer, feedback and interaction with a, with a technology-based drive to make new things and make, make the media. Let me show you some of my images. <laughs> I'm trying to see what you're going to do. This is great, man. Yeah. Let's kind of like sum this up and uh, I'll kind of take, give some of my takeaways here. Yeah. How and long do you want this summary to last? Because well, you got you got two people that will talk about this for the next forty five minutes in a summary. Well, I, we'll have an opportunity to <laughs> right. go into more depth. All right, okay? you, you give us direction. So we'll what I'm seeing out. here is a totally new designed camera system. Yeah, yeah. A back that doesn't have anything left over from any of the other backs, except uh, for maybe the outward appearance. The the, you know, the four button interface uh, right. has become yeah. you know common knowledge and standard with you know the phase one style, but even those buttons do different things, which we'll, we'll get into on yeah, the user yeah. interface side. But you now have the ability to uh, tether two ways, well mm -hmm. actually three with Wi-Fi. So you have USB-C, yes. you have Ethernet, and you got a Wi-Fi. Yep. And they work in connection with each other so that Yeah, in a very one, symbiotic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if one goes down, the other kicks in. Mm -hmm. You've got two storage cards, an XQD and an SD. SD because it's so readily available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm but an XQD because it's got a lot of advantages of being robust, fast, and uh, yeah. it has a, I don't know if strength is the best word, but mm. you know, it's kind of built well. And on yeah. top of that, the, the system, you know, uh, XQD is one mm -hmm. physical format with one uh, kind of, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking protocol? for? Protocol. Protocol, thank you. One protocol to talk to the camera, but there's another physical format that's the exact same, CEF Express, which is a different protocol. So yeah. we prepared the system that, you know, even though they, they look the exact same, they're gonna communicate in different ways. The system's ready that when you get a CF Express card, just plug it in and away you go. But regardless yeah. of what card, you have complete user flexibility mm -hmm. to determine whether you're sending JPEGs to one card, RAWs to both cards, or vice versa. Yeah, yes. I mean, there are some, they're, they're completely arbitrary limitations that we've put on there just because we don't want to spend the time to develop, you know, putting a, a mirrored JPEG on both the XQD sure. and the SD. So right now the JPEGs just go to the SD. But if customers demand that we need a JPEG on the XQD as well as the SD, fine, no problem. We mm. can make that happen. And you can shoot to card and tether at the same time as well to have that uh, redundancy. Yeah. And as far as, you know, the actual shooting file, before with many of the phase cameras, you had uh, lossless and lossy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now you've got four different. We've got we've got five, five. in total. Five yeah. in total. Right. Yeah. So, so we have we have the the lossless, we have the lossy, that is not very lossy. It's very difficult to make. Even yeah, this way, sure. you can see the difference. We, 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 yeah. we have fourteen and sixteen bit, um, and then we have this uh, super super careful conversion mode that takes a little bit longer, but makes a cleaner file. And then we've got the binning. Yes. The what? The the quarter size file. Oh, the quarter size yeah. where you bin bin them. Yeah. Yep. Pixel binning. Yep. So, pretty amazing. What else? Oh, we talked about histograms. So you've got yes. the, the ability for a raw histogram and a JPEG histogram. The the live view now is significantly smoother. It works better Ooh, in low light. It's uh, and we, we we added the focus peaking there to to for because to we help with the, precise focusing. The processing put, power and the better live view. So now we put also uh, the same two uh, histograms. The uh, the eight bit yep. processed one and the raw histogram in live view as well. Um, what else do you do? Well, I think just overall the speed of the system yeah. is, is much better. You know, just capturing images, clearing the buffer, but then browsing the images, zooming in, panning around. I mean, all that stuff is just... And, and I'll say, based upon my experience shooting yesterday, I was pretty amazed that, you know, we were out there. And what I was pretty cool was I didn't realize Live View was working. When we were setting up for a four-second exposure, Right. you know, it was like, what? And then all of a sudden, four seconds later, I'd get a new Live View shot looking at it, so that it actually was actually showing the water movement. Yeah, so and yeah. Live view works in it's a like way amazing. right now where whatever your exposure is, that is what live view is showing you. So if you have a two second exposure, you're getting a two second preview 
a preview yeah. every two seconds. The frame rate would be that. Right. Same to and then, you know, of course, we want to expand this into a direction where, okay, I'm, I want to shoot a two second exposure, but I don't want to see that in live view because I just need to focus it real fast. Well, we're going to put a, a way in there so that we can kind of hybrid the, kind the of line. Kind a new finer mode. So, uh, but essentially, we, we, uh, we designed both the processor, but, but, but the whole platform, the data moving platform to be completely programmable. There's no fixed pixel pipeline in this device. It's all programmable hardware. So all the way from, from the sensor and the rest of the pipeline to storage, to, uh, to the screen, to processing, everything is completely, totally field programmable. So we can change any aspect of how this works to keep on adding features. So essentially, even though it, it on the outside, well, it, it looks very much like an IQ3. Of course, there are different ports, different yeah, cards, yeah. Yep. but it, well, the physical form factor we were pretty happy with. But on the inside, it's totally, completely optic. There's nothing shared. It's a completely new uh, hardware platform. So the difference between an IQ3 and an IQ4 is quite a bit bigger than the difference between a P45 Plus and an IQ1. God, I'd love to see how you crammed all that in there. <laughs> it you wasn't know? easy. I bet it wasn't big, easy. One of those blow up yes. diagrams. Oh my that you, you goodness. Have. Remarkable camera. Don't forget that the camera has a lot of other capabilities. So one of the things that I've always loved working with this camera on is uh, focus stacking. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, that's really important, specifically as a landscape photographer. Mm -hmm. And it, there's kind of like its own built-in intelligence when it comes to that, yeah, based yeah. upon you know f-stop shutter speeds and a number yeah. of other things. It knows exactly what to do to get there. Uh, and there's a ton of other built-in features. It's all touch-based, so everything you operate, you actually operate by touching that. Or with system. the physical buttons if you're wearing gloves because it's cold winter day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, you know, it is a camera that you need to experience even if you don't think you'll ever be able to afford it. Having an appreciation for it, it's like, you might not ever be able to buy a Mercedes, but if you can visit a Mercedes showroom and yeah. sit in the car, mm -hmm. you, you you begin to get um, an idea of you know what engineering can do and what you know can be yeah. be there. It, it opens your mind up to things that should be done further by others and maybe eventually yeah. will. And be, I but. think you know a lot of the, the the best feedback I ever get with uh -huh. this camera system is from people that have never picked it up before. And I think that's you know my message to anybody watching this is go and, and just use one of these camera systems, even if you don't want to buy it or think you're going to buy it, and tell me what you think of it. Yeah. Because a lot of the innovations that came with this camera system came from people that, well, I'm never going to afford a, a phase one camera system, but I used one the other day, and wouldn't it be amazing if you could do X, Y, Z? And I mean, they're just outside of the box uh, mm -hmm. feedback that I, I absolutely love getting. And we intentionally made this new one so we can actually take that feedback and right. do something about it. And yep. get it in there. And it is intuitive. And this is something I think is important. You know, we learned this with the iPhone. When the iPhone came out, there was no manual. I think there was a little, here's your on off button. Right, you good know, luck. Pitch and zoom. Right. And essentially, if you're a photographer and you just sat down with this and started touching things and seeing where they went and what there were, you'd have it figured out. I yeah. mean, you, mm. you really, you know, you might need a manual a little bit or some understanding on how to do you know, some focus stacking and you know, what, what that means and a few things along those. But once again, you know, I didn't have anybody. You know, I tried to call you and you didn't answer No, phone, I left so you alone. Mm -hmm. I just kind of figured it out on my own. So it is pretty intuitive. Yeah. So I must say, you guys have done one hell of a job with this. It's a fun yeah. camera. It's got a lot of power. It can be somewhat overwhelming, but when you take a breath and come back to it, you realize the overwhelming is not as overwhelming as it is. It's just like, why haven't I ever seen this before? Yeah, that's Thank good you. to hear. And Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, you know, thanks. That's, that's what I think this is all about. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about in the next segment and, and show off the interface itself. Yeah. And uh, we still have a segment on Capture One and how that all works also. So um, Lal and Drew, you guys, like, you, you, you do good together, <laughs> but it, you've really done an excellent job putting this camera together. And uh, uh, I ask and, and say to all the readers and viewers, Find a dealer, get out there, and just experience it. It might change a lot of things about how you look at photography. Thanks, we hope, guys. We Thank hope you. so. Yeah. Take care. See you later.